Today's conversation will include a discussion with two dynamic leaders who, are, who have led in the area of not only subnational diplo diplomacy, but also foreign relations. Mayor Garcetti, uh, who's the mayor of the second largest city in the United States, has made working to support the idea of city and state diplomacy a major part of his tenure. He also serves as the chair of C40, an organization of major US mayors that are taking bold action on climate. We're also del delighted to have Congressman Ted Lieu from California, the 33rd district, where he represents LA, Los Angeles County, who is a member also of the US Committee on Foreign Relations. Congressman Lou authored the legislation that we're gonna be talking about today, HR 3571, the City and State Diplomacy Act. We would like this conversation to be interactive and so we're going to be dedicating a time for our audience to participate. So please submit any questions that you have in our for in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. But more importantly, we thank all of you for taking the time in the United States and throughout Europe to join us. I'm going to now turn the conversation over to GMF's president and moderator today, Dr. Karen Dunfrey. Over to you, Karen. Thank you so much, Rita Jo. And I just want to say that we couldn't be luckier than having Rita Jo here at GMF. She was the first ever special representative for global intergovernmental affairs under Secretaries of State Clinton and Kerry. So she knows these issues of state and local diplomacy so well and has been an engine of activity and engagement here at GMF around those issues which is why we're so happy to welcome Mayor Garcetti and Congressman Liu today. And also a welcome to all of you who have joined us for this conversation. I just wanna to say to both the mayor and the congressman how heartbreaking it is to see the tragedy of the fires that have spread across the state of California. And all of your friends across the world are pulling for California and keeping you very much in our thoughts. We're grateful for your leadership on that front but today we want to focus on your leadership on this front of subnational diplomacy. Mayor Garcetti, as Rita Jo mentioned, you're mayor of the second largest city in the U.S. And so many jobs in Los Angeles depend on international trade, foreign investment. Rita Jo mentioned the climate issue. You currently chair the C40 this network of the world's mega cities committed to climate change. You also are using that network to address the pandemic. You're very active in the relationship between California and Mexico, creating a commission in partnership with Mexico's foreign minister. Help everybody listening understand this aspect of your job that is called international diplomat. Mr. Mayor, over to you. Please call, call me Eric. Thank you, Karen, to you, and thank you so much to Rita Joe. And it's great to be here with my dear friend Ted Lou, an extraordinary representative uh, for the United States and for this entire world. Who we've both known each other before we were honorable and before we were elected. So I appreciate so much having time to chat with you and with him. You know, you you hit the nail on the head. Um, I lead a global city, um, now the third largest global economy in the world of any city. Um, Tokyo is the largest, and New York and L.A. are basically tied for second. We're a little bit a hair behind, but 19 million people that comprise a GDP that would be uh, one of the top 15 countries of the world. Um, and every single day in order to do my local work, I have to engage with the global, not just because of a diverse population, perhaps the most diverse in one city in human history, uh, but the largest you know, port in the Americas, the fourth busiest airport in the world and the busiest of origination and destination, um, a place in which, as you see from the fires um, and the droughts that we experience, things like global climate crisis is critically local work as well. And I also look at it in a very positive way. You know, I grew up here in Los Angeles in 1984. We welcomed the summer games uh, when I was just a kid. And I saw the face of the world on the streets of LA. But interestingly enough, as I began to live and work, uh, study abroad, whenever I was away from Los Angeles, I would see the face of LA on the streets of the world. In other words, I was comfortable in Cairo or in Tokyo, uh, in Mexico City, and almost anywhere because growing up with this kind of kernel of belonging and inclusion was something that allowed me to really have a foundation to help manage a city of such a diverse population. So, 
whether it's a potential port strike that could shut down the American economy that I have to jump in to negotiate, whether it's looking at, um, you know, when our president threatens to withdraw from the Paris Accords and I organize 400 plus mayors around the country across party lines to say, if he's out, we're in. We constantly are getting pulled into the international because we know that we are global cities, even in the smallest town in America. So any good mayor, not just in Los Angeles, but around the world today, she or he is doing work that's both at the block level and the global level simultaneously. Fantastic. And I just want to say to all of you who've tuned in, feel free to use the Q&A function on Zoom to send me your questions, because I'll try to weave as many of those into the conversation as I can. But Mayor Garcetti, that is a great scene setter for this conversation, the, the role you inhabit every day. And Congressman Liu, you have authored the City and State Diplomacy Act to establish a permanent office of subnational diplomacy at the State Department. So I'd love for you to explain why it's so important for state and local officials to have a permanent centralized resource to help them make informed decisions. So please share with us your thinking there. Uh, thank you, Karen, for uh, your question. And let me first say thank you and Rita Joe for your leadership and for everything that uh, GMF does during these very uncertain times. Uh, and it's my honor to be on here with my longtime friend, Eric Garcetti. Uh, he's right, we've known each other since before we were elected. And I have to say, he's one of the few people I know that just doesn't age. He looks the same now as he did over two decades ago. Uh, and he's done a fantastic job uh, as mayor of Los Angeles. And thank you, Eric, for your support of this legislation. Uh, I started off as a member of the Torrance City Council, it's my hometown, and I remember we were, welcome all these delegations from various countries. Uh, we had a sister city in Japan. And then when I was in the California State Legislature, we would take trips uh, to different countries uh, to promote trade, uh, to get agreements with California. And when you look at how the United States structures its government, uh, you have all these cities and counties and states that can do whatever they want as long as it doesn't conflict with the federal government. And you have this enormous power uh, to be able to do a uh, subnational diplomacy, to interact with other countries. And I wanted to help uh, cities, counties, and states uh, do exactly that. And what this legislation does is it first of all creates an office within the State Department of subnational diplomacy. And second, it authorizes State Department officials to go to cities and counties and states and assist them with uh, their foreign policy that they're doing, uh, whether, for example, it's like California that signed an MOU uh, with Israel on water technology, or if it's local cities that want to do agreements with other cities and other countries, uh, or if, if it's something like uh, what Mayor Garcetti is doing with C40 trying to tackle climate change, you can have assistance from the State Department uh, that can uh, basically leverage what cities and counties and states are already doing and make it better. And Congressman Liu, Give us a sense, how broad is bipartisan support for the bill? Do you think that bill will move forward and potentially be passed this year? So this bill has bipartisan support. It was introduced with my friend, Representative Joe Wilson, a Republican out of South Carolina. It also got marked up in the Foreign Affairs Committee and passed out of the committee. Uh, so many of you know uh, the way Congress works is most of the time people introduce bills and nothing happens. Uh, but the fact that a bill gets heard in committee and then passed out uh, is very significant. So we're very pleased that that happened. But then uh, it went even further. We were able to insert essentially the language of this bill into the National Defense Authorization Act, which is must pass legislation. And that passed the House floor. It is now on the Senate side. Uh, so it's our hope that the final version of the National Defense Authorization Act will retain this language uh, and then it will become law. Super. So Mayor Garcetti, I'm interested in from where you sit, what would this bill and creating this office in the State Department mean for you and connect that to the decision you made in 2017 to create a new position of Deputy Mayor for International Affairs in LA to bolster global opportunities. What is that position in LA allowing you to do and, and how would this office at State be meaningful for you at the city level? 
You know, it would be a huge help, and I, I just want to thank Congressman Liu for introducing this and inserting it into a must-pass bill. Uh, it's a brilliant work of legislation, uh, but the content, not just the process, is equally as brilliant. You know, most diplomacy happens uh, between individuals, whether those are business leaders, whether those are NGO leaders, uh, whether it's students on an exchange. I mean, I can think about the most probably meaningful diplomacy I engaged in when I was a young person was being an exchange student and living in Tokyo uh, and going to a school called Tamagawa Gakuen. I've been ever since linked to a family, regularly go to Japan, uh, engage, and now as a mayor, when I travel there, there's a depth of that interaction um, that I know the culture. I've lived in Thailand, I've lived in Eritrea and Ethiopia. Uh, my wife and I met in England and lived and traveled throughout Europe. These relationships that you can establish, whether through business, through travel, through education, um, and in the end also from cities to cities and states or regions to regions is extraordinary. It was in 2017 when I went on a trip to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Los Angeles and Berlin's sister city. Uh, relationship, a very important one, in which it had just been announced that our president was withdrawing from the Paris Accords. I, uh, people asked me, I was asked to speak at the town hall by the, my counterpart, the Burgermeister uh, in, uh, in Berlin. And at that moment, I said, don't worry, we already have enough people who have signed on in, through their cities to doing something on climate change, as there are people in Germany. And the whole crowd, which was kind of celebrating, went, ah, and could go back to drinking beer and celebrating, doing everything else they were doing. You know, diplomacy happens uh, beautifully uh, at its best, at the highest level, national leaders, our State Department, foreign ministries, but it really is that level, and it occurred to me we needed stronger representation formally. And so Nina Hachigan, a former ambassador to um, ASEAN uh, and a friend of mine who would worked in National Security Council, I said, hey, I have this crazy idea creating the first deputy mayor for international relations. We've got the book of work. This isn't just receiving notables. This is negotiating trade agreements between our port and shippers. This is about uh, opening up new offices in the city that has the third most consulates uh, in any city of the world. Uh, this is about encouraging um, tourism and new plane routes. And I really need somebody superb. And her, together with Dilpreet Sidhu, who's my director of international relations, we're doing everything from implementing the sustainable development goals um, and tracking those and showing those to folks to working on uh, these sort of more business um, and um, even public safety agreements that we have across oceans. And to me, I hope it's the model, not just for other American cities, but most other city, big cities in the world had it. So I think uh, US has kind of been later to the game on this. But it really is you know, a big book of business. Last example I'll give you. Everybody knows the Paris Climate Accords, but you probably don't know the largest agreement on climate before Paris. That was in Los Angeles when we got together the first ever US-China Mayor's Summit, um, which we brought cities together from China and the United States and states and regions as well. And we signed dozens of bilateral and trilateral agreements at the subnational level. That's where Guangzhou and Beijing announced that they would cap their emissions 10 years earlier, the biggest agreement in the world before Paris. And that came out of these engagements, peer pressure, excitement, sharing best practices at the subnational level. So I think this legislation will put a home to this in the State Department, but it will also promote the philosophy of this, encouraging others to build that capacity at the local level in city halls, uh, in governor's um, mansions, you know, in those places where people can make a difference in everyday lives on top of the national agreements as well. So Margaret City, let me stay with you for a minute and draw you out on this network function, sort of what comes out of cities forming networks around issues. And I'm interested in it for two reasons. One is uh, one of my colleagues here at GMF is, we have a cities program and he is bringing together city directors of international affairs. Actually, we're delighted LA is gonna participate in this. But when you think about networks, is it connecting on substance or how important is geography? I mean, LA, are you looking more at Asia and Latin America or are European cities as important in those networks, A? And B, one of our listeners wants you to go into more detail on the substance of the network, specifically the C40 and what your priorities in the C40 are as chairman. 
So those are wonderful questions and thank you. I think the answer is unfortunately both. Uh, sometimes it's geography and sometimes it's topical and it, all the geography leads to topical issues. But for instance, the work that we do uh, between Europe, between Latin America and with Asia is about trade. It is about the Los Angeles International Airport. It is about the jobs in my city linked to what we can get in terms of agreements, whether it was, for instance, um, the Netherlands Business Support Center that opened up, or the uh, Republic of Ireland never had a consulate in Los Angeles, even though it's one of the biggest populations of Irish outside of Ireland. Um, we actually have about 30 something countries we can make that claim for where the, you know, the biggest population of Canadians outside of Canada is, the, is Los Angeles. The second biggest Mexican city in the world, including all those in Mexico, is Los Angeles. So absolutely, it is about affinity. It is about sometimes culture. It is about geography. And it is about the substances, I mean, su the substance that you're working on. Uh, in terms of C40, it's a great example. C40 really is a network. It was funny. It was going to be C20 and it was gonna be the capital cities of all the G20 cities, uh, sorry, G20 countries. Uh, but immediately people realized you couldn't just put Washington DC as the representative of the US, you also wanted New York and any global thing. So it became C40 and now it's actually, uh, don't tell anybody, but 96 cities, we're not gonna rename ourselves because it's the brand. It is the 96 largest cities in the world of the largest hundred. And it isn't just an extremely uh, you know, useful network for climate emergency work. It is the network, the go-to network for mayors to talk to themselves around the world. Uh, case in point, when this pandemic broke out, um, as chair, I kind of hit the back signal and asked everybody across all these time zones to get on a Zoom call, one of the most moving experiences of my elected life and maybe life altogether. I think we got about 55 different mayors. These weren't, you know, mayor's representatives. This wasn't, you know, folks from small towns. This was the mayor of London and the mayor of Milan and the mayor of Seoul and the mayor of Delhi and the mayor of Melbourne and the mayor of Mexico City, all together talking to each other about what is happening in the world in this moment. And so while at the national level, things were moving much more slowly across borders, maybe borders were being closed off, this, that, and the other, but cooperation was something much more slow moving, much more nationalistic in terms of a rivalry. Even now you look at things like vaccines, where countries are competitors, mayors are collaborators. So we look at those best uh, you know, uh, practices. For instance, we heard from our Korean and Asian counterparts about early and rapid testing, which inspired me to stand up the kind of most extensive testing regime on my own because I wasn't getting that national help in Los Angeles. We heard from the mayor of Milan, this was before New York became the hotspot, when Northern Italy was the hotspot. And he started walking us through how you make decisions and structuring in hospitals those decisions of who's gonna live and who's going to die. I mean, immensely heavy, difficult things. But thank God we had this network uh, and we took it a step further and saying, now let's give the pathway for recovery out of COVID-19. And we've written an interim report, we'll have a final one this year, written by mayors from every continent of the world about how to deal with COVID-19 and come out of it economically. Green stimulus and emphasis on public transportation, building re resilient cities, looking at um, uh, renewable energy. So this became a network really influencing up. And the final point I'll make is at the next COP, um, which is the you know, conference that Paris uh, Climate Accords came out of, it'll be in Glasgow, Scotland, it was gonna be this year, it'll be next year. We're speaking directly to the United Nations. I've spoken to the, the UN Secretary General about a city's action because probably national governments won't be ready to do something at the level of Paris for a couple more years but we have to keep pushing. So we aren't just participating, we may actually be driving the main agenda there. So this is an example of where if you're not focused on a subnational diplomacy, you're actually missing the progress of the world that moves quicker, more coordinated, less competitive, and can produce results that ultimately help national governments too. Those real examples are compelling and it was fascinating to hear also on the pandemic, how you were able to use that network. Um, for constructive good. And Congressman Liu, I want to ask you a question that's uh, come in from one of the folks listening that is saying the idea of legislation is excellent, but doesn't it risk being influenced at the State Department by executive level political priorities that might not be the same as those at the local and the regional level? So it's really a question about sort of the bottom up coordination that maybe you're seeing through something like the C40 and being concerned about, could there be a different top down prioritization? So Congressman, how do you see that? Well, that that's a great question. Uh, so when you look at subnational diplomacy, uh, 
particularly at the city level, uh, it is nonpartisan. And that's uh, one of the beauties about it. Uh, you have uh, both um, Republicans and Democrats and independents, everyone going on these uh, delegations. And they're just trying to um, help out their city as well as the city of the other country. And it uh, results in a very good diplomacy. So when you have the State Department um, office, uh, the goal of this is to provide advice and resources to the local cities and counties and states. And again, um, cities and counties and states can do whatever they want as long as it doesn't conflict uh, with the federal government. So we don't think the State Department, in fact, this bill doesn't give the State Department any authority to change what the cities and counties and states are doing. Uh, it just provides resources uh, to uh, these uh, cities and states and counties. And not every city is like Los Angeles and not every mayor is as great as Mayor Garcetti. So you're gonna have mayors, for example, let's say in Kansas that maybe haven't thought about doing international diplomacy and this might help them, it might help them and give them resources and give them ideas so that maybe they think, oh, maybe I should take a delegation to this other country and talk about my agricultural products and so on. So this is designed to help leverage cities like Los Angeles and everything that Mary Garcetti is doing, as well as to help cities and counties that currently are not doing this to engage uh, in subnational diplomacy. So Congressman Lou, I'm gonna stay with you and then I'm gonna ask the same question to Mayor Garcetti. One of our listeners is saying that he's a local planner. And he said, my experience has been that international work at the local level is often perceived as irrelevant or worse, wasteful. It seems that international work by cities and counties is, it's not often clear what the concrete benefits are. And sometimes that work isn't framed strategically. And so the question to you, um, Congressman Liu, is do you think your bill will help that? Could that office at state help with some of these efforts being more strategic? And, and Mayor Garcetti, is that a fair criticism? So Congressman Liu, first to you. Uh, I actually have a different view. Uh, when you look at, for example, business regulations, a lot of it is done at the state, county, or city level, business ordinances and so on. Um, so these local units can make uh, deals in a way that the federal government could not uh, when they are engaging with, for example, let's say other countries and businesses in other countries. Uh, in addition, I realized that on a number of these trips I took when I was in the California state legislature, you would go to this foreign country and it would be front page news. And I found that uh, interesting. I hadn't realized that before. So a lot of these uh, other countries uh, do take it quite seriously when a delegation from the United States visits uh, at the subnational level. And it's a way to change hearts and minds uh, in a way, for example, that maybe Secretary Pompeo cannot. Uh, it's a way to have these person-to-person -person engagements. And I think Eric Garcetti had it right when he said diplomacy is done basically at the people level. And the more engagements you have, I think the better it is for the United States of America. So if we could get every city in the United States to start doing this, it would actually, I believe, help our foreign policy. It would let other countries see how we do things in the US, uh, see how our government works, understand how our democracy works. And I think subnational diplomacy actually can have a lot of effects uh, that the federal government is unable to do uh, with our national diplomacy. Fantastic. And Mayor Garcetti, as I turn to you to respond to that, let me add another question which is relevant for this. One of our listeners uh, noted his thanks to you for sharing the U.S.-China mayor collaboration. Mm -hmm. And he's wondering, given the current deterioration of U.S.-China relations, what can mayors do to be helpful in that overarching relationship? So it might be a concrete example in response to the previous question. Over to you. Absolutely. You, you know, when, when um, national conversations break down or heat up, uh, I find at the local level across um, continents or oceans, they continue. Uh, they continue because families, businesses, organizations, and local leaders are usually connected in a much less partisan or uh, much less political way. Uh, for instance, C40 is sitting down even at a low point between U.S. and China relationship, uh, relations and helping write a lot of the green building uh, ordinances within Chinese cities. 
which is probably you know in the in the biggest emerging economy and the biggest emitter emerging emitter uh, probably the most significant act because buildings emit the most of all sectors. Um, similarly, you know we can engage, for instance, C40 is very engaged within the EU, um, getting funding directly from EU member uh, countries to be able to do work in Africa, um, to to work in Latin America and parts of the developing world where we bring this mayor's network in. Uh, so I don't find it wasteful. I actually find it much more bang for the buck at the local level uh, sometimes than at the national level. Now, the enforceability, which I know also came up in the chat and is related to this, um, you know, you use the same tools that you do in international relations. When I was a professor of international relations, I always remember in my international organizations class, when we told people about international law, I would quote uh, Louis Hankin, one of the kind of uh, forefathers of international law in the post-war era who I studied with, um, at Columbia and used to say international law exists because we say it exists. So we have to build on trust. We have to build on membership, uh, shame, and any material, um, either benefits or punishments. Um, that's the same at the subnational level. For instance, in C40, we've kicked cities out that haven't been compliant with putting together their climate action plans. Uh, so there is an enforceability on that. Um, uh, again, at the as we see at the international level, just because we say rules exist too, or, uh, you know, organizations mandate things. National governments break those all the time in the most developed uh, nations and in some of the least developed nations as well. So it really is a very similar parallelism uh, to both of those things. And I do think that there's nothing that's stronger in this day and age than peer pressure. Uh, so, you know, we always find C40 cities are coming to us saying, hey, um, some of my citizens learned about what's going on in this town in Germany, and now they want me to do it. Can you research? Because I've got to do it too. So it becomes kind of a, um, a peer pressure in a positive way that people see what's out there. And so much of what moves things in terms of global movements today, whether it's racial justice or whether it's climate change, whether it's economic uh, inequality, these things are uh, needing quick answers. They're needing a network that can be much more nimble than these large uh, international agreements that sometimes take decades uh, to bring about. And when they do come about, they need to be retranslated at the local level. I just did a panel uh, during UN General Assembly Week about you know, what we're doing with the SDGs in Los Angeles. We have a dashboard that puts very honestly how we're doing on gender equality, how we're doing on housing, how we're doing on health, how we're doing on water, so that our citizens can hold us accountable to these global standards and vice versa, the world can see Los Angeles is actually participating, even if uh, our, our national government doesn't seem to be too enthusiastic about the United Nations at this moment. So you mentioned this issue of racial equality and a couple of the folks who are listening are interested in the extent to which these kinds of networks beyond focusing on, on business aspects or climate or even addressing the pandemic, which in many ways we've seen quite clearly has uneven impacts on our citizens. And is there an opportunity to use those networks also to talk of issues related to racial equality and, and lessons we can learn from each other, or also for promoting greater democracy in terms of sharing ideas around open budgeting or inclusion, constituent engagement, um, so, you know, Congressman Liu and Mayor Garcetti, I'd love to have each of you speak to that as well. Congressman Liu, why don't we start with you? Yeah. So, Karen, the last half of your question is sort of faded out. Can you say the last half again? So, the, uh, the question is whether these city networks, beyond contributing on the business or economic front and the climate front, we've had the example of pandemics, which we know have an uneven impact on citizens. Can these city networks also help on issues of racial equality or greater democracy in terms of sharing ideas around inclusion or open budgeting? So thank you for that question. So um, you did mention two things before the question. You talked about the pandemics and sort of the businesses. I want to note again that um, local taxes is another issue that cities uh, can address, for example, uh, in a way that the federal government could not. And so that's another reason that we would want to have more of these um, subnational uh, delegations because they can, in fact, do deals uh, that the State Department could not do. In terms of the pandemic, I just talking to my various hospitals, my district and other hospitals, it's pretty clear the federal government was not very helpful uh, at the beginning in getting PPE 
So they were getting it from other countries. And again, it was relationships uh, with other countries uh, that, that was able to help uh, the people here in Southern California uh, get the PPE that was needed. And then in terms of the race issues you identified, uh, so one of the cool things that I like doing um, is when you come back into the United States and you fly through LAX and you're going through customs, uh, I remember that when you go through many other countries, everybody looks the same. When you go through customs in LAX, everyone uh, is uh, this amazing tapestry of what America is, all different genders and races. And um, it is really an amazing explosion of diversity. Uh, so when you send a delegation of the United States, let's say from LA, that is incredibly diverse, and it shows up in a country that is mostly homogenous, that in of, of itself sends a signal. And I think, again, increasing the number of delegations and uh, amount of subnational diplomacy we can do, uh, actually, I think, projects to other countries just how diverse and beautiful America is and what a strong democracy we actually have. And so simply having uh, these uh, delegations appear in other countries is in and of itself a good thing. Yeah, I agree, yeah, I agree 100%. And you know, it, it, every single day we see the proof of that in the pandemic. We had such an extraordinary outpouring. Um, unfortunately, immigrants were written out of federal legislation, not because Congressman Liu, he supported it, um, but you can be the spouse of or even a child of United States citizen and or legal citizen uh, of an immigrant, and you didn't receive the cash payment that your neighbor did um, in the midst of this pandemic. So we started raising that money privately. Um, we started raising money to make sure that it would cover everybody for the basics of groceries and rent. We hope to raise 15 million wound up raising over 45 million. But it's interesting where some of those dollars came from. We got donations of PPE from Asia. We got um, a contribution of $5 million from a, a sovereign nation. Um, we got um, you know, calls. I had the Prince of, of Jordan call me and say, hey, we, we make some PPE, not the, the masks, but the, if you need the suits, we've got those, we make that. You know, we made deals both directions. We're helping each other. It was just human beings helping each other in need. But because we had established these relationships, because I've represented local government and been in Beirut and Amman and Jerusalem in the Middle East, because I've been, you know, in, in Berlin or Copenhagen, London and Paris um, um, in the East uh, Asia region, you know, I've traveled to those uh, countries where a lot of the shipping was coming through. We were able to actually work those relationships. In fact, I redeputized the executive director of the Port of Los Angeles, that largest port in the Americas, I knew that he knew a thing or two about logistics. So I made him the chief logistics officer of the city of Los Angeles during this pandemic. And I think uh, Ted will testify that all of us got thousands of people saying, hey, I've got a line on masks. It was a wartime economy. Some of them were hustlers. Some of them were well-intentioned but couldn't get it done. Some were legit, but then they get taken away at the dock and diverted to a higher payer we were able to shift through that because of our existing international relationships uh, with these companies, with uh, these countries, with the sub-state actors. We got donations from electric bus manufacturers. We got donations from cities that were sister cities um, and vice versa, we tried to help as well. And on racial justice, it's the same thing. While this was seen as a very American moment, we saw around the world, a solidarity around racial justice and also the voices, for instance, in C40 of the African uh, peers of mine who are mayors they're saying, we also want to make sure racial justice is tied into the work that we're doing between nations, because racism doesn't just exist within nations, it exists between nations. And so we were able to elevate this moment of racial justice beyond just the deep needs of our country, and also look at that globally, reinforcing the, America's kind of strength in this fight, but also going and helping others feel inspired to not be isolated about combating institutional prejudice as well. So to me, it's, it, you know, this is the network that's moving the world um, and the recognition of tying this in, breaking down between national and subnational and just saying kind of global is going to be a really important, I think, chapter in diplomatic and, and um, just human history. So Mayor Garcetti, that's such a fascinating example about how during the start of the pandemic, you were trying so hard to get PPE and working your connection to get masks and you know the logistics of the port must have been incredible. Let me ask you, is that a role that the city should be playing or do you think it would have been better if the federal government had been managing that? I mean, what are the right roles for a city versus a federal government in, in something like a pandemic? 
Well, that's an easy answer. I would have loved for the United States uh, to have enough mass to have distributed them perfectly, to have had a testing strategy, all of these things. We can, we can unpack what wasn't done during this pandemic and how uh, local governments and state governments were left in the lurch. But I also recognize human beings will never be perfect, that even uh, if it were a different administration, there would have been all sorts of um, demands on the supply chain. There would have been difficulties. We would have had to still tap into the relationships that we have. So it's not should we have to. We're happy to do that. In fact, we're not Los Angeles and the United States of America. Los Angeles is the United States of America. So when we're moving everything through that port that I mentioned, that's going to every other city in the United States of America, every small town. We've done a study actually uh, saying how many jobs are in congressional districts in Maine and in Florida, as, as Congressman Lou knows well, because we go and lobby for this the port of Los Angeles and people think it's far away. We're like, no, it's tied into the jobs in the shop on Main Street in Bangor, Maine. Um, you know, it's tied into the, the hardware store that's in Pensacola. So we are very good at, I think, um, happily engaging at that local level. It's not that should we or shouldn't we, of course. National government should always do the best job that they can, and I'll be the first to point out where they fall short. But we're always going to need the subnational and national level. We've got to get rid of the idea that nations are these capitals that collect all the money and then just redistribute it and get back to the way at least the United States was founded and also Germany as it came together, which is the collection of local um, um, communities that do comprise the nation. They together are the United States of America. They together are Germany, not vice versa. So Congressman Liu, we have another question that gets at this, the relationship between the national government and, and cities and states. And this one, um, the, the listener is citing an example in Portland saying Portland introduced banning human facial recognition technology in the city. What do you see that could be initiatives by local governments in managing individual privacy when major tech capital is reshaping the life in cities? And so he's interested in examples of how cities might grapple with some of these really difficult issues that perhaps we're not managing today. So focus specifically on digital technology. How would you answer that, Congressman Lewis? That's a great question. Uh, by the way, I'm one of four recovering computer science majors uh, in Congress. <laughs> I'll be one of three next term because one of the members is retiring. And uh, facial recognition technology right now uh, is a problem in the sense that uh, it does discriminate against people who have darker complexions. And what that means is if it has a picture of someone with a darker complexion, it will be less accurate in identifying that person, could misidentify that person. And if you deploy facial recognition on a widespread basis with this defect in it, what it ends up happening is you have a whole host of racial and ethnic uh, disparate treatment happen. And you have essentially, um, to me, an equal protection violation. Uh, so I'm glad that Portland did what it did. I think we need to improve just as a technology, on a technology basis, facial recognition uh, technology. And I have uh, legislation I'm working on in Congress that would put in standards before we can have people at uh, the government level start deploying um, this kind of technology. So what this could do as an example of subnational diplomacy is you could have various cities talk about this issue with other cities and other countries and see what their experience is when it's been deployed. It's ability to share information among the various cities around the world to see if in fact uh, it's a good idea and second if some cities have been able to fix this problem. Uh, but right now my view is just specifically on, on facial recognition technology, uh, the problem has not been fixed until they fix it where everyone is treated equally under this technology. I don't think it should be deployed by government. Mayor Garcetti, do you want to speak to this issue of regulating tech, not just about facial recognition, but California in many ways sort of assumed the GDPR legislation, the data privacy legislation that the European Union passed. So on many areas of digital technology, California is, is leading, and I'd love to hear your views on that. Yeah, I would say, I just came up with it, so it's a working theory. I would say there's kind of three Ps to consider, uh, the practicality, the privacy, and the profitability of things when we look at technology. And they don't always align. 
Um, but I do think that cities have a unique role to play kind of, again, in crossing boundaries and establishing standards. And I'm going to give you one interesting example. Um, I agree with Congressman Liu that, that this is, you know, incredibly enticing, but very dangerous technology potentially used in the wrong ways. We're seeing other national governments do that. And I think the last thing we all want to see is kind of an authoritarian techno uh, model of uh, local governance. Um, and there is that temptation because people sell things to your police department. They sell things to your fire department. Sometimes it's exciting, you know, fire department, I've got cameras that are out there. Uh, that can see fires and feel them detected at a microscopic level long before anybody would call because there's smoke um, and we can respond quickly and knock fires down. On the other hand, and we use drones to manage fires. On the other hand, if you put drones up uh, for the police department, I think rightfully so, we'd all be, wait a second, what is that? Even if we have helicopters that we use sometimes when we're chasing a suspect or, or monitoring a situation. So you have to be very delicate, I think, on the privacy end. Um, but then you have a lot of companies that are already moving the technology. If you're not keeping up to this because of the private pro the profitability, uh, they are moving something forward, which is where the collision comes between what's profitable and practical. And practical is on two fronts. You need practicability for a city. And here's, here's an example. When suddenly we woke up one day and somebody had invented the electric scooter and they were, they were just dumped on sidewalks everywhere. And we, we thought people had left their scooters. Remember the first time you saw one and you thought somebody had left a scooter out and then you saw this was a new model of something. Um, there was really no standard for how these many companies would overnight, there is I think eight or nine in the city of Los Angeles, would begin to share information with us. So we had two choices, either be no, shut it down and you know make it uh, not something that would exist in Los Angeles or um, say, okay, do it, but we're going to run roughshod over us. You know, they're giving a choice. Uh, business always says, don't stand in the way of progress. And I try to not do that. But on the other hand, I have a responsibility to seniors or people in wheelchairs who need to get by, the look of a city, um, you know, the traffic, et cetera. So we developed, uh, the head of our Department of Transportation for the city of LA came together with other heads of departments of transportation around the world and began to develop a standard that would mandate that they share the information from these scooters with us in an anonymized way. But so just as we have right now, um, a very analog way, whether, you know, signs, for instance, we regulate the street all the time, but the color of the curb, the signs that say when you can park, parking meters, we wanted to digitize that so that we would know, for instance, when a thousand scooters show up at a sporting event and they're just dumped there, the responsibilities of that company to make sure they're redistributed so that it doesn't create a fire hazard and chaos when the game lets out or something like that. There was a lot of pushback and these companies said, big brother wants to spy on you. Now these are companies that actually know who you are with your name, exactly where you're going, are sending you Starbucks tickets you know, or discounts because they see you go by that Starbucks in your neighborhood. I mean, they've already invaded your privacy and the nerve of us in an anonymized way wanting to have a standard that would tell us where these are, not with a person attached to them, but where they were so that we could um, manage traffic it was a real fight. In the end, all but one company, one of the biggest ones, whose name you, you well know, um, capitulated and has joined us. And that's now become a standard across, I think, three dozen cities of the world started in Los Angeles through a conversation and a practical thing we had to deal with. So Mayor Garcetti, I know you need to go to your next appointment. I don't know if you have time for a closing question or if you need to. Yeah, sure. like, I'm, I'm good. I'm fine. Let me ask you a closing question because we good. have several folks who are asking about sort of what happens when there's a misalignment between federal policy and city or state policy. And climate might be a good example. What happens in those cases? How much autonomy does LA have? So maybe it's a game theorist in me, but I'd look at this as kind of, uh, you know, two axes. One is, are you given power or not? Meaning in the formal structure is your local government around the world, some local governments are more ceremonial and some are more substantive. And then do you align with power? In other words, are the people in power locally aligned with those who are in power at the state or national level or not? And I think then you get a box of kind of four possibilities. Obviously, if you're not given much power and you're not aligned uh, to the power, you're not going to have the exercise of much significance where ideally you are both given power and aligned with power. It's your formal power as well as your informal influence when a national government will come to you, as I did in the previous administration. Uh, and this was across party lines. This isn't a partisan point, but the Obama administration met regularly with mayors 
Democratic and Republican mayors, and pulled some of the best ideas from what was happening, what they wanted to do at the national level from those conversations. When I got elected in 2013, about six months later, I was elected in the spring, most mayors in the fall, uh, uh, President Obama and then Vice President Biden invited us into the Roosevelt Room for about a two hour discussion. And we went across, went from Rochester and Los Angeles and New York and Philadelphia, and we went straight around the, the country and they listened to what was happening there. And so the informal power was boosted as much as the formal power. You know, I don't have a school district under me, um, although Mayor de Blasio does. On the other hand, I have the largest municipal utility in the country and a port under my authority, and they don't in New York. So every city is different. And then you see certain parts of the world in which really, I was talking to an African mayor recently who's part of our C40 network, whose national government, who's not aligned with her uh, in terms of the political party, and they're trying to basically abolish the local government and put a state minister in there that would essentially take away all of her powers. So it really is a combination of those two things. Are you aligned with power? Do you have power? But more times than not, uh, mayors are having to become more increasingly powerful and cities more increasingly powerful because national governments realize they don't know the first thing about sewers um, and storm water. They don't know how to mitigate a lot of the climate change work. Uh, they'd rather have you do something on energy. Uh, they usually don't do local public safety. So all these things that they rely on us, they're happy for us to do because they're very difficult things. Try solving homelessness, try addressing a pandemic, try trying to build racial justice. I think national governments are like, go for it, that's yours. On the other hand, mayors are ready to accept that challenge. Local governments embrace that challenge and they have international uh, ripples, which is why this has been such an exciting panel to be able to look at really this legislation that would embed that principle across whoever is in power, uh, that our government, at least in the United States of America, would prioritize accelerating these connections, uh, these agreements, um, these breakthroughs, and this hard work because the world demands it and all the global progress we need has to start where we live. Super. Well, thank you so much, Mayor Garcetti. And we wish you the best from stores to support. <laughs> And um, thank you so much. I appreciate it. <laughs> Congressman Lou, I want to come back to you. We've had several of our listeners asking about interagency cooperation, you know, in your legislation and, and your vision. Do you see a role for commerce? Um, and on the other side, what about the role that the Chamber of Commerce could play at the city level? So help us understand how these other actors in the subnational story play their roles. Uh, that's a great question, and hopefully this legislation becomes law, and if it does, then we're going to do additional legislation that gets other federal agencies involved, uh, but certainly uh, commerce and some other agencies would also have a role to play in assisting uh, local governments and counties and states. And then uh, the Chamber of Commerce, uh, both at the national level as well as the individual city and county level, uh, can play a big role as well as at the state level. I actually uh, was a, a member of the Torrance Chamber of Commerce uh, early on, and I remember we would welcome all sorts of uh, trade delegations uh, from other countries. And you can have not just the local governmental units, but also the local business organizations also be involved. And diplomacy relies on more than just government. It relies on everyone who wants to try to uh, make the world a better place, uh, including uh, the businesses uh, in a local city. And so Chambers of Commerce can play a big role as well. So we have an interesting question from one of our listeners saying that because of the COVID-19 pandemic, because of climate change, there are some people who are saying, oh, we used to think the future was these mega cities, but actually people now want to move away from cities. What's your wisdom? on the future of megacities. Uh, so you're asking me uh, to uh, make a prediction and I'm very bad at predictions, <laughs> um, uh, but I think you're gonna see some structural changes in society as a result of this pandemic. Uh, we know that uh, a number of people realize that working from home uh, actually works. And so you might have more companies that have more policies that allow people to work from home more often. I think this pandemic has also exposed what happens when you don't give people health care. You see a huge disparity between African Americans, Latinos, Native Americans, and Asian Pacific Islanders in terms of COVID death rates. And 
we have to make sure that we tackle uh, the healthcare issue. And then in terms of people wanting to live away from mega cities, uh, I'm not sure this pandemic would be the major driver of that because we see, uh, in fact, that this pandemic has now affected um, red states and rural areas as well as mega cities. I think people uh, will make a decision whether to live in a city or not based on, on other factors such as housing and transportation and so on. Uh, but you will see, I believe, a much higher focus on making sure everybody has health care, on making sure that America is resilient for a future pandemic. Uh, there's no real scientific reason why another pandemic couldn't hit us. Hopefully it won't hit us uh, in a long time, but it could also hit us in a relatively short time. So I think there'll be a focus on making sure we have the domestic capability to respond adequately to a pandemic the next time it comes around. And I think it's affected how we view national security. Um, who would have thought uh, that what we needed to prevent 200,000 American deaths were masks and gowns and ventilators, uh, not bullets and F-16 jets? So Congressman Liu, I'm going to ask you one last question before I, I give the floor back to Rita Joe, And that is, within the City and State Diplomacy Act, how would connections between cities get established? And would it focus primarily on sort of mega cities or cities with bigger economies? Or is there room in this initiative for cities of all sizes? Uh, there's room uh, for cities of all sizes. And this, first of all, this is already happening, right? Subnational diplomacy has been happening for a long time. What this bill is designed to do is to leverage what's already happening and make it better uh, to help amazing cities like LA and amazing mayors like Mayor Garcetti leverage the amazing work that they're already doing, but also to get cities that haven't been doing this to think about doing this and say, look, we're gonna provide you resources. We're gonna provide you expertise. We're gonna uh, provide you guidance and help you do some national diplomacy. So that's uh, the intent of this bill. Well, that's fantastic. And I, before I hand the floor back, thank you to everyone who's listening. There are an enormous number of questions still left in the queue. My apologies. I tried to get as many of them as I could. Congressman Liu, it was fantastic to have you, but I'm gonna hand it back to Rita Joe because to quote you, she is an expert at leveraging what we are already doing and making it better. So Rita Joe, over to you to close. No, thank you so much, Karen. Uh, we want to really thank uh, Mayor Garcetti and Congressman Liu for just providing their great insight and to, to see leaders who are taking leadership on this particular issue at this time and this moment in our, in our history is so important. As we move to 21st century uh, diplomacy and look at the power of, we know, soft power, and that is what we have always defined as working also with some national diplomacy. And so, you know, this is, we believe, a, a just a great time um, to be able to raise uh, the issues that local leaders are critical uh, to helping their constituency understand U.S. leadership abroad and to be able to not only to understand our U.S. leadership abroad, but our story at the local level where it's the best ways to be able to communicate to Americans um, about our global future. And so just for our audience, again, to say thank you for joining us. You know, this is going to be a, a continuation of a conversation that GMF has been doing uh, in the work of some national diplomacy. We were right there with Mayor Garcetti doing the Paris Accord uh, in, in France uh, with a delegation of mayors. We have been hosting at GMF governors and mayors around these topics and around other issues around trade and investment. And so this is, as they say, this is a, a, a great beginning for us. And to have Congressman Liu on this call with us, who has really pushed this uh, matter forward, this, this issue forward to institutionalize at the US State Department, this work is so important right now. And so as Karen mentioned, we will be uh, launching at GF, GMF uh, Cities, a new network on city uh, directories in March. Uh, we're going to be working with our transatlantic leadership team um, that focuses with the Marshall Memorial Fellows and uh, in its network of so many of the young professionals that are from state and local governments. And we'll be working with uh, TLI on their civic and global in, engagement work. And so 
We are excited that also on October 7th, many of you will be invited back. We hope you join us again when we have a meeting of the mind conversation with experts and, and other scholars in the field and to discuss the future of subnational diplomacy. And so with that, we just want to say thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, it's been a great conversation. And Congressman Lou, thank you again for being with us, you and Mayor Garcetti. And that concludes our program. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Bye-bye.